amount of times I've heard jinx over the years. There we go. So, technology seems to be back with us. I, I, I laid hands on it, biblically, obviously, not physically. So how are we all, church? That was nearly good, fine, thank you. There was lots of ones there. Anyway, um, I think I did write this in one of the newsletters before, but um, there was this guy who hadn't attended church and he hadn't been there two or three weeks. And so his pastor decided to go on a home visit and see how he was. He hadn't heard me, tried phoning him, couldn't get through. Internet connection probably failed. Um, but he, was, he came in and his wife opened the door, let him in, and this man who was sat by the fire, watching the fireplace, and there was like a coal fire. But this pastor didn't say anything to the man. He just walked up to the fire, got the tongs, that's a word I think, grabbed one of the coals out of the fire and put it on the hearth and sat down. And over the next five minutes, they both sat there in silence and watching the coal go from bright orange back to black. Five minutes later, the pastor stood up, picked the coal up, put it back on the fire, sat back down. Another five minutes passed, the coal was red hot. The pastor got up and walked out without saying a word, apart from saying, and they heard the man say to him, Pastor, that's your best sermon yet. <laughs> so if you've got a coal fire, I'm not coming round. <laughs> but the point being is that when we're not in community, we're not together, and we're not around each other, it's very difficult. So that's my sermon title today is a slow fade. Is that coal because it wasn't in community of the other coals, which are red hot. And we have times when we're not feeling on fire ourselves. But because we're around those people, we feel that heat. We feel that warmth. We feel that, and it keeps us lit. And next week, it might be you keeping someone else lit, because when somebody else is down. So it vaguely relates to, to my sermon for the day. I'm going to take it, and this is always interesting. I'm going to take you to Revelation. Now, people thinking, right, it's the first day here. We don't always preach Revelation, by the way. It's actually the first time I've preached Revelation here. And it's not going to be, we're not going through too much of it. I really wanted to give you an introduction. And who knows, it may become into a, a, a series at a later date. But there was one sermon, one scripture, sorry, that was specifically had, had come to light. And in particular with reference a little bit with what we were talking about, Satan Smokescreen, last week. So, but revelation, the word, it's a funny word. Um, it literally means unveiling. That's literally what it means. There's the, um, the actual Greek for it is, now I'll get this wrong, but um, it's apokalubutin, which apo is un, and kalubutin is to cover. So it's to uncover. So the original Greek that was given, so it's to uncover. And this was to uncover a prophecy. This was, the letter was given to John, now we know John because he was Jesus' favourite, of course, the one whom Jesus loved, his self-confessed priority. He, there, his, he confessed that he was the one Jesus loved by himself. But I just want to give you a little bit of a background. It's approximately AD 95. The Roman Emperor Titus Flavius Domitian was demanding to be worshipped as a lord and god. So he was, as quite often as the time, there were people at the time were demanding that you know they look upon them as, as, as a divinity, as a god. And obviously we're in, in the early years of the Christian faith, and those Christians who wouldn't worship well, stood up to a lot of persecution, death, beatings, I should have done it the other way around really, beatings and death, um, and, and lots of persecution. And obviously John had actually been, there been a number of occasions that they actually tried to punish him already and had failed. So they whisked him off to Patmos, which is a, an island which is a Roman penal colony where they just basically dumped him on this island and left him to die, fundamentally. So John at this point is an old man. 
so he's sent off. And I guess there's not a lot to do on an island there by yourself. If you're under the Mediterranean sun, I'm not sure there was a tapas bar anywhere near. Um, so I'm guessing you're spending a lot of time in the presence of God. And this revelation, this unveiling, was given to John. So it's a prophecy of the end times and of Jesus' return and what's going to happen. And it was actually revealed, we quite often just think about Jesus giving this prophecy, but there was angels, there was even a voice from heaven, there was, there was various things that this was where that basically, fundamentally, this letter, this message, this prophecy was from God. However, God, God gave it to Jesus, which is the opening thing, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants. Quite often we think it's a difficult book to read. You read it and you go thinking, what is that all about? Because you have some strange pictures. We have so much imagery. We look at these things and we're thinking, why? Why have we got these beasts and all these things that are in the book? Why is he talking about lampstands and, and stuff? Now, we have to remember whenever we're looking at the Bible that we have to look at the culture and the time and what was going on. So a lot of these references would be references to culture as was then. So to understand the Bible correctly, we have to apply some of that. We have to look back before we can look forward. But there's a couple of things that I was thinking about while while the symbolism. And one first, it could be think that it was a spiritual code. A spiritual code for those of followers of Jesus. Because it's that thing, if we have, John, you and I have a conversation, we might talk in some slang or something, and we understand one of the, you're from the Midlands, like myself, and we would, you know, yeah, all right, oh, and, you know, we would, we, would, uh, we would do that, and other people would be looking around just going like, what? What are they talking about? But, so there, there's, there's that kind of code, and that is because if, bear in mind where John was, he was on an island, you know, it was obviously guarded ultimately by the Roman emperor guards and, and the stuff, and that if this document, obviously he was writing all this down, that if this was found, it could be used against Christians, potentially. If he's given this prophecy of things to come, this stuff potentially could be used against them to persecute them. You don't want to leave evidence around. The second reason why I'm thinking that he used pictures is pictures don't get weakened by time. Words, we can often think we can mix words up, but quite often, most of us, whichever way we look at it, um, we t- Kerry talks a lot about the type learning style that we are, and, and quite often, most of us can be quite visual. Now, I might be visual, but I'm, I'm kind of a mental visual person, so I, I hold those mental pictures when I'm reading. Some people like when the screen works, like to see stuff up on the screen. And we all learn differently. But over thousands of years, pictures generally don't weaken. The meaning of a picture just generally doesn't think. So you see a picture, you remember a picture. And you remember a picture is containing a whole story. I mean, you see a picture of Noah's Ark, you remember the kind of pretty much the whole story, don't you? Yeah? The man? So that's my second kind of thought. I don't want to understand is don't, because they're pictures, don't mean they're not going to happen. doesn't mean to say they're not true. It doesn't mean to say, you know, they, these are real events that are going to happen. He's just used imagery to portray those. I mean, words weaken. I mean, it's like now. I mean, even though I, couldn't, I was going through this, this whole thing about words weakening over time, and we've talked about, Phil and I have talked about this, about translations, uh, about Bible translations, about how we have so many newer ones that the language has changed because our use of language has changed. And then the first word that came to mind was wicked when I was talking about that. Now, we, you know, back in our day, wicked, you're talking about a witch, and you're talking about that. Now it's like, it's wicked, it's good. So if we're using words, maybe those words can be corrupted. Just a thought. But as I said, don't take the symbolism that they're not, the things aren't real that we're talking about, because they are very, very real. Thirdly, the third reason I figured, and this is just kind of some, some backup about Revelation and why it is like it is, is why did he use pictures again? Quite often it's to arouse emotion. 
Because when you, he could have quite easily, there's going to be a really bad dictator. You know, but in cho- instead he chose to write, there's going to be a beast. Now, beast sounds a little bit better, different than a dictator, a global dictator. And we, we know who we're talking about at this point. But it's how it's conveyed, how it's presented, how our emotions, and there are people's thoughts and views of when you look at, um, actually, is this just hyperbole? Is this just an exaggeration for, us, for our emotions for this, or is this actually what's going to happen? We can sit and debate that for a very long time, but fundamentally, the picture is there to get you to the severity of what is going to happen, or the importance of what's going to happen. But what I don't want, we can, there's lots of music, um, stories that have run away with the revelation story, for one of the prophecy. They've taken it and they've run away with it and they've taken it to something it's never meant to be. Taking it for something that's, that's corrupted it, and we talked about that last week, about Satan takes things and corrupts things. Let's not let our imagination run wild. Let's just read it as it is. Biblical symbols are always consistent with biblical revelation. There are over 300 references in the Old Testament, uh, sorry, 300 references in Revelation of things in the Old Testament. So these things are tying together. This is not just some randomness. This is things the people of the time would have clearly understood what this meant because of their knowledge of what we call the Old Testament. So we must anchor our interpretation in the Bible. So whatever we look at, we interpreting Revelation, we must first look at what that might mean and cross-reference it back to the Bible. Amen? Let's not run off on a tangent. So with that said, if you'd like to turn to Revelation 3. Four, three, fourteen, and 15. Now I'm actually chosen to read out of the NLT today. We should have been, no, giving away my points. I haven't got the NLT. He says. I know all the things you do and you were neither hot nor cold. I wish you were not one or the other, that you were one or the other. But since you are lukewarm like water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. That's quite graphic. Now actually, some of the words that are chosen in that, so we have spew in the King James, we have vomit in the New King James, we have lots of words. It's quite graphic, isn't it? And it's like, that sounds a bit harsh to me. But there's a point. These are these seven letters that have been written to seven churches. And the traditional view of what they've talked about here about being hot or cold is hot is like, normally we think of you know, hot as being zealous, as being good, as being that fiery. It's all like you know, some real kind of atmosphere. That's go- the cold is completely kind of uncommitted to something. You know, when you say, oh, I'm a bit cold about that, you're completely the other end of the spectrum. Lukewarm is kind of, it's in between. It's, it, it's neither one thing or the other thing. With the exception of Robert, I know most people either like their cold, <laughs> their hot, co- hot coffee piping hot. You know, when I drink my coffee, I drink black coffee, and I like it absolutely piping hot. That's how I like it. Or when I like a glass of water, I like it really cold. I don't like a tepid glass of water. Does anybody want a lukewarm glass of water? Not necessarily. Does anybody want a cold cup of tea? Generally speaking, not. There are some exceptions to the rule. I understand that before everybody heckles me saying, yes, I actually like cold tea. But actually, you think of of the time, we look at the history, and I'm talking about applying this to the time. This is a letter to the Church of Laodicea, who basically were a very rich town, city, within, um, uh, within the times. They were known for their um, uh, their fabrics, for their eye salve. They were very rich. They were very independent. There was actually an earthquake, and the Romans had decided, and they said they were to pay help to rebuild Laodicea. And the Laodicean said, 
No thanks, we can do it ourselves. We don't need your help, we're fine by ourselves. So they were very rich, but they'd become compromised in very many respects. They'd been, they, were neither, um, they were neither hot nor cold. The hot springs of the nearby town of um, Hierapolis would come to supply them with hot water. But by the time it got to them, it was a little bit lukewarm. The cold water, they'd get their pure fresh water from Colossae, and by the time that got to them, it was lukewarm. Neither ones were particularly very good for them. And they mixed in the aqueducts. So there was talking about Jesus is making a reference to people of the time would understand this is the church of Laodicea. This is a church that had compromised. Hot, good, cold, bad. But I learned a new word. That it, was, it was emetic, which means to cause to vomit, basically. And that was... That was, you know, lukewarm, does do that. You have various things. It's just like, ugh. It's neither, these are neither left or right. The church at Laodicea had become complacent. They had almost lost their fervency for Jesus. They'd lost their first love. They had seen Jesus and they'd become, the church had been planted. But over a period of time, they had become complacent. Why is it? That when you first become a Christian, you're so fired up about everything. You want to set the world right. You want to do this. All of these holy discontents. You want to put the world right. You want to say, you see something happening in your church. And it's like another pastor said to me, why is it all the new believers cause problems in church? No, they don't. They just recognize problems in church. Because they haven't got clouded over by what's it. Oh, yeah, we just it's fine. It doesn't matter. but they have conviction. The city was rich. They didn't need anybody. They'd become independent, satisfied, self-secure. Jesus wasn't telling them about whether they were hot or cold, whether they needed to wear a jumper or put a vest on. He was actually talking about their spiritual temperature. He wasn't saying, put your jacket on before you go or take it off. You won't feel the benefit when you get out because it's cold. He really wasn't. He was using this imagery. He was saying, your temperature, you have spiritually become complacent. A kettle without electric goes cold. A fridge without electric gets warm. They need a power source. And for us, our power source is Christ. We must remain plugged in. Batteries go flat. I can keep going with these symbols. And we can use our own. I'm only doing what John did way back when. To help understand. When we become a Christian. We're grateful for his grace. We want to share the gospel with everybody. We're so excited about what's happened. But also we want to do something to try and thank the Lord for what he's done for us. And quite often things are always black and white. There is no gray areas. I have told the joke before. Well, it's not the joke. Real atheist, real dream. You see the devil, this, this atheist has this dream and he sees the devil on one side and these people playing around and then there's a fence down the middle and then there's Jesus with children playing around. And this atheist then gets caught later and he's sat on the fence. And he's like, he can't make his mind up what's going on. So he's just sitting on the fence and there's a little tap on the shoulder. He went, I'm the devil. And he said, the fence is mine too. Indecision. By not making a decision, you are making a decision. So we become complacent. It then, we look at things we do, and we're so righteous initially with how, with how things happen, with what we do, what we do at church. We're thinking we see our life changing. We see things happen. And we go, when we first go, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to stop watching stuff I shouldn't be watching. I'm going to be doing something because we're all fired up. We feel that conviction. But slowly but surely, oh, that one's all right. That's not so bad. 
I can do that. I'll just have the one pint. Or I'll just watch that TV programme. When morally, ethically, there's something wrong with it. But actually, it's not that bad. And so we start watching something. We start doing something. And before we know it, then it's like, oh, that leads us on to, oh, we get desensitised. We lose that righteousness that God's put into us. We lose that fact that, oh, it's okay. And it reverts us back to what I was talking about last week when the devil came in the first sentence and said, did God really? Did he really? Don't worry, it's fine. You'll be okay. So it becomes a slow fade. We don't notice it at first. You just think we're there. We, we, get, we go from being from, from so left or right, but we just end up little compromises. And before you know it, you've compromised everything. We call ourselves Christians. We call ourselves holy and set apart. But yet, as you walk down the street, is anybody going to know you different to anybody else? Or are you just another person? And they see you, are they going to say, wow, what's different about that person? I'm not telling you what to do, and there's many things we can do. We should just know, we should just be seen. And we should have that. People go, you know, I, I want people to turn up to you and go, what have you got? Because whatever it is you've got, I want. Because there's something different about you, and I need to know what it is. Rather than just being one of the others. For me, it's simple. Lukewarmness, I'm not sure that's a word, is a disease. It gets in. Rot sets in. We start compromising little things. But thankfully, Jesus gives us the cure in Revelation, and I think it's verse 19 or 20. If I can turn it, I'll go back to mine. To whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Be zealous and repent. It's a, it's a cure, verse 20. I think it's actually verse 19, my text. But be zealous and repent. So what does that mean? How is the cure? How does being zealous, is that going to fix us? Because we need to remember where we were the day that we first met Jesus. We need to remember what the difference he made in my life, how grateful you were. So we've got to stand up for what we believed in, what we first believed in when Jesus believed in us, when no one else would. We have to remember that day. And then we have to turn around. We have to repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have compromised my life just to be part of the world. When actually we're set apart, when we're called to be in the world, not of it. Jesus wasn't actually being mean. Jesus wasn't being spiteful when he said these things. He was just trying to convey to people the severity of what it, and actually extending the hand of grace to them and saying, listen, you're not where you should be, but you're going to be where I'm going to lead you. Come with me. Jesus is always full of grace the true conviction should be in you that I'm going to be a zealot for Christ now we talk about Simon the zealot we talk about zealots in the Bible but let's just be zealous for him let's be do you know what let's just not contain it when people see you they're going I want it people turn around to you and say oh do you know what you know if you whatever you're at work and somebody says oh it doesn't matter you know, those pens are bought by the company, but if you want to take one home, take one home. It's all right for you to play on the internet for half an hour. Nobody's watching. You people, that's not theft. We're stealing time. I worked in a, in a warehouse, one of my many tent-making jobs, and it was a, a, a cross-docking where we had deliveries come in and we had to then cross-dock everything to go back out to, um, it's like a distribution centre. And we had no deliveries the one night come in. Um, everybody's kind of sat down doing nothing, being paid for doing nothing. And everything's fabulous. But there's something that everybody hated in, the, in, in that, and it was called hygiene. And basically that meant you swept the floors. Now this warehouse was not a warehouse where you pick them. This was like going from, you know, you'd have a, a million suitcases come in. And it was for Matalan, actually. And, and, then, and then it would go, this one million suitcase would be split across 20 trucks and then go out to 
the Matalan. So it wasn't. It was like kind of. It was very dark and dingy, and and, and the dust was literally about three foot deep. Might have been an exaggeration, but it's just a picture I'm giving you. But it was horrible, wasn't it? Dan? I would come back that day. I came and I'm covered in dust. I'm actually tired. I, I mildly am asthmatic, and this was not healthy. But the guys, I'm sweeping, and there's this room about as big as this, and it's not been touched ever. And the guys want to use it. We've, we've, they've increased the stuff. They need to start using this room for, for some cross docking. And the, and the super had said, "Can we, you know, can we get that?" Anyway, the other, the, like, there's like only ever ten on a shift, and the other nine guys were in the coffee room doing what? And they walked past, and there's me sweeping. The super wasn't around. So what are you doing? I'm going. I'm earning the money. I mean, what are you doing that for? Nobody's around. So well, they've asked us to do it. We can do it. Why don't we do it? And I just kind of look on their faces like. And walked off. I said, well, I'm just going to sit down. It's fine. But I couldn't be there. And everybody, I'm, and anybody who knows me, I'm overtly Christian. I am what I am. No, everybody knows that I'm a Christian. And any environment we go into, they know I'm a Christian. I make a point of telling people I'm a Christian. It also holds me accountable. Because I don't want to embarrass my Lord and Saviour. So if people know I'm a Christian, it does hold me accountable. So, but they go, and they're thinking, they're well weird. But then there was a guy, an innocent, he was, he, his name, he was a Nigerian guy. Um, and he actually went to a church that, w- that we had a connection with. And he then, he was like that calmly, kind of, so, so you're a Christian then? And he then started, the conviction within him was saying, he was sat around doing nothing. And he came and helped. And I was like, and then another one helped. And it's like, but some of them just sat there and did nothing. Let's be known by our fruit. Fight compromise. It's a battle. We all, it is a battle. It's not easy sometimes. And somebody says, you know, you know, just the one Mrs. Wembley, whatever it was, it was, the, it was, you know, some, oh, it won't matter. It's just once. Just one apple. Yeah, so one apple is all it took, or pomegranate, or whatever, in whatever fruit. It was actually biblically correct here, but we all understand the apple. So, did God really? Yes, God really did say that. God did say that we should be separated from the others because God has given his son for us that we may have eternal life with him. Amen? Amen. And I am one. And don't get me wrong, do I make mistakes? Yes, I do. Every day. Am I big enough to hold my hand up and say I've made some mistakes, darling? Yes. And that's not me bragging. That's, well, that's me bragging about how rubbish I am sometimes. That's not me going, I'm perfect, because I'm far from perfect. I do not set myself on a pedestal. I am a normal human being with faults and flaws, and I will continue to make progress, though. Yes? Are we all going to make progress today? Amen? So, how do we do that? How do we do that? You need to devote yourselves to his word. First place to go is here. This is Jesus this is God. This is everything. We need to spend time in this book. You know, it's a manual for life. <laughs> call it what you will. And I used to call it an agile framework because you can read the same scripture a hundred times and it will mean something different because it's applied to your life at that time. Amen? Yeah. Living and active. Prayer and devotion. Next, spend some time with your father. Spend some time in a quiet place. If you want a quiet place, don't come next to me because I'm quite noisy. But actually, ironically, I'm, I am you know, quite a bold person at the front here and I'm quite full of beans. But you know what? Half the time, just, I'm just quite happy to be in my own company. Because at the moment I'm with my own company, I'm in his company. And you will notice there are quite a few clocks in church. And the reason is because that actually causes me a distraction because I can get easily distracted by what's going on around and what else is going on out in the world and what's going people going by. But the sound of a ticking clock is mundane enough that I'm focused on hearing the tick, tick, but I'm missing the kerfuffle going on outside or the conversation. Do what it takes for you to focus. That's what it takes. Kerry hates the sound of a ticking clock. I can literally watch a clock 
uh, it's more interesting than watching paint dry because you do see the hand going round. But, but it just allows me to focus. Some people have different things. I also have a wooden, you have a wooden holding cross. Something in your hand when you're in prayer and devotion. Something to, because it is really easy. Joyce Mayer talks about prayer naps. And we've all done it. We've all been in the devotion time and we've <coughs> nodded off. I do it frequently. We've all been there. But actually, the only one is when I actually take that nap, sometimes I'm still praying in my head or I'm still thinking. I go, oh, bless you, dear Lord. <laughs> you're still in that place. So they're not all bad, particularly if your devotion time is five o'clock in the morning. When I was on the bins, it was really early because we had to be at the bins at five o'clock in the morning. Another one, and that was, you know, that could talk about focusing your mind then. But even that, even that I, found I struggled to do my devotion before I went out, I had an audio Bible in the car that I would listen to the 15 minutes it took, no, that was Arrow. The 15 minutes from the, 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 I would do something just to be in it. Do anything that brings you closer to him. And also, finally, praise and worship. I don't know what type of music. We all like different styles of music. Some of us like rousing stuff. Some of us even like Christian rock. Some of us are just like quiet, contemplative music. Or a mixture of all the above. But what you're doing is you're giving him your praise and your worship. You're focusing on him. It lifts your soul. It, pray, it brings that in. King David. Play his lyre, harp, mini harp, whatever it was. His Rickenbacker. He would play to lift his spirits and his soul. Spirit and soul. I guess we all have to stand for something. Because if we don't stand for something, we will fall for everything. So for me, Joshua, as you know, or those of you know who know me, Joshua is my biblical hero, next to Jesus. At the end of his book, Joshua says, Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Amen? So make your choice today. Who am I going to serve? Am I going to be hot for Jesus? Amen. Somebody, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Preach. So I am. Does that, does, does that, does that mean I'm going to get it right? As I said, no. Does it mean everybody's going to get it right? No. But let's just try, eh? Yeah? So are we going to go home today? Where are we going to go? Are we going to think, right, what can I do? to demonstrate that I'm on fire for Christ. Amen? We're going to find something we can do. Yes? Every single one of you? And the people said? There we go. We nearly got all of you there. So, that today is the end of my word. It was something that was kind of vaguely connected with last week's message about the smokescreen and about us being complacent, about us being distracted. And I really feel that God is using this opportunity to talk to us um, about just being a better version of you. Yeah? God made you. God loves you. Don't be a copy of someone else. Be you. But just be a better version of you. The version that God made you to be. Amen? Amen. Gentlemen, would you like to come and lead us in a song of praise and worship? Be blessed and highly favoured, everybody.